Pope Francis has established himself as the most unorthodox pope of modern times. He is constantly making proclamations that are either unbiblical or contradict basic Catholic doctrine. For insights about this controversial pope, stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. I'm Tim Moore, sitting in for Dr. Reagan today, and with me is my co-host, Nathan Jones, our internet evangelist. Also in the studio with us today is one of the ministry's dear friends, Mike Gendron. Mike has been our guest several times in the past and is also a frequent contributor to our magazine. Mike, welcome back to Christ in Prophecy. Well, it's a privilege to be back. I've always admired Lamb and Lion Ministry and Christ in Prophecy because you're never fearful of addressing the most controversial issues that face Christians today. And we'll be talking about one of those in this program. Most certainly. Excellent. Well, folks, Mike's the founder and director of a ministry in the Dallas, Texas area called Proclaiming the Gospel. If you watch Christ in Prophecy, you know Mike's probably one of our most frequent guests because he's an expert on a particular cop topic, Catholicism. Can you tell us, Mike, why are you an expert in that? And maybe share a little of your testimony. Well, sure. I lived the Roman Catholic life for 35 years. I was a very devout Roman Catholic. My uncle was a Catholic priest and... For 35 years, I did everything necessary to be saved according to the Catholic religion. And I even went to church every day during Lent because I had the understanding that God was going to grade on the curve. As long as your good deeds outweighed your bad deeds, then you had a good chance of going to heaven. And so for 35 years, I lived that life. I studied Catholicism very in-depthly. And then at the age of 34, I began reading the Bible for the first time. First time. And I had a Catholic Bible. It was the big coffee table version that sat there just collecting dust. We were told never to read it because it was too difficult to understand. And so when I began reading it, I had a crisis of faith because what I was discovering was a plan of salvation that was diametrically opposed to what I was taught as a Catholic. And so I had this crisis of faith. Should I continue believing what the Catholic Church was teaching me or should I put my trust in Christ and his word. And so during that crisis, God opened my eyes to see the truth and he granted me repentance. I I turned from trusting in the plan of salvation as a Roman Catholic and put my trust in the biblical plan of salvation. And I trusted Christ as my all-sufficient savior. That literally turned my life upside down because I recognized that if I was going to trust Christ in his word, I had to leave the church that deceived me about life's most critical issue. And then you went and started a ministry ministering to Catholics? Well, it wasn't right away. Because okay. um, you were in the business world for a minute. I years. was. I was uh, in corporate management for 17 years. But shortly after the Lord saved me, I was like a dry sponge in a desert. You're soaking I wanted up to, the word. I wanted yeah. to soak up the word. I was in a Bible study every morning of the week before I went to my, uh, my job. And so that led me to enroll at Dallas Theological Seminary. And primarily, I wanted to purge myself of everything that was wrong, being indoctrinated as a Roman Catholic, and fill my heart and mind with the truth. Well, at the end of my seminary studies, we began inviting Catholics over to our house. We had a great burden to reach Catholics. Within three months, we saw 17 Catholics exchange their religion the for a relationship Lord. with an all-sufficient Savior. Well, I love the fact that you say our Savior is all-sufficient because he, he certainly is. And you made the point of the Catholic religion, and there are many religions in this world, but what we point to is faith in Jesus Christ, our all-sufficient Savior. So as we consider the Pope right now, Pope Francis, and we're not here to tear him down, but we want to observe some of the things that he has said and some of the doctrines that he's kind of muddied in recent years. And we will point out that Pope Francis is the first Jesuit who has served as a Catholic Pope. Tell us what that means. Obviously, you have a great wealth of knowledge just through your own personal background. What does it mean to have a Jesuit serving as Pope? 
Well, it means a lot. It's got um, some very significant ramifications, not only within Catholicism, but also within Christianity. The goal of the Jesuits, which were established at the Counter-Reformation in the 16th century, their goal was to eliminate any opposition to the papacy, and including the Protestants who had, mm. you know, the Protestant Reformation, people were leaving the Catholic Church, and so the Jesuits were established as the secret police of the papacy. And so today, now we have a Jesuit pope, and of course his goal, as is the Jesuit goal, is to bring all people under the power and influence of the papacy. And so that's why you see this ecumenical movement that's so powerful today. It's invading evangelicalism. Many of our evangelical leaders today are embracing Roman Catholicism as a valid expression of Christianity. And so this is all the Jesuit agenda. And we know from biblical prophecy there will be a global religion. Yes. And the Pope is now wanting to be the head of that global so religion. So the Jesuits were almost the enforcers of the Catholic doctrine or the Catholic, as you said, religion. That's correct. That, during the Counter-Reformation, many, many uh, Protestants were killed. Was that the Jesuits behind a lot of that persecution to try to force them back into the church? It's a very colorful and um, brutal history when you study the Jesuits. They literally went to war against any opposition to the Catholic Church. Wow. I think one of the most powerful examples was the St. Bartholomew Day Massacre, where the streets of Paris were ankle deep in the blood of the saints. The Catholic Church was putting to death those who opposed the papacy. And in turn, they gave those who put them to death plenary indulgences, yeah. which meant their sins were completely forgiven. My wife's family uh, comes from Huguenot background, and those were the Protestants who were killed. It's interesting that it's such a militant branch of the Catholic Church, but Pope Francis, before he was Pope, came out of something which we think is more loving, a liberation yeah. theology or a social gospel. Could you explain a little about what Pope Francis's background is at that makes him so endearing to Catholics? Well, sure, that's part of the globalist agenda to um, do the things that are appealing to the masses. And liberation theology is really a form of Marxism, and it's to help the oppressed and help the poor. And so before the Pope became Pope Francis, he was in Argentina helping the poor and through this liberation theology. But it's all part of his global agenda to unite the world under the power and influence of the papacy. And we can be clear, obviously, the Lord himself, Jesus Christ, advocates that we yes. care for the poor and the needy, but the Marxist ideology is through a totally different means, uh, whether it's critical theory. Uh, we've seen a whole lot of critical theory just in the last several years in this country, but the Marxist means of helping the poor does not lift them up. Instead, it's determined to tear everyone else down, and that's really what the Pope has been a part of in, in terms of his past with liberation theology, tearing down all the institutions. Uh, one of the other things that Pope Francis uh, really is demonstrating his unorthodoxy. And, and as an aside, folks, orthodoxy is simply a determination to hold to traditional biblical values and doctrines. And so what has been passed down uh, by the saints of old is the orthodox teachings of the church. But this pope is so unorthodox because every time he opens his mouth, it seems like the Vatican itself <laughs> has to hold a press conference to backtrack what he has said. And, and most famously, in recent years, He's even seemed to endorse homosexuality. He said this, Homosexuals have a right to be part of the family. They're children of God and have a right to a family. Nobody should be thrown out or made miserable because of it. He went on to say, who am I to judge? And, and things of that nature. And yet the Vatican immediately had to say, well, well we are not endorsing same-sex marriage. And, and even most recently, a, one of the congregations, the groups of, of hierarchy there in the Catholic Church, came out with what they call a dubium which is an official doctrinal statement that reaffirmed the church is not going to, the Catholic Church is not going to embrace homosexual marriage, and yet many bishops were upset because they thought this pope had been giving clear signals that he intended to move in that direction. So what kind of a mess has he created in so many areas? Well, you're right about the pope not being orthodox. In fact, that's the reason that he is so controversial. He not only stands opposed to historic Roman Catholicism, but also to the Word of God. Mm. And so you've got some conservative cardinals out now that are actually um, opposing him and actually looking for him to resign. 
And so there's a, somewhat of a rift now in the Roman Catholic Church between the conservatives and the liberal the Pope liberals. Francis. And but some it, of the liberal bishops. I mean, the German bishops, for instance, were very upset that the Pope did not just embrace homosexual marriage because they were already preparing various sacramental vows and, and blessings for homosexual couples in Germany, the, the bishops. So there has been a schism within the church. And the feminists, too, are up in arms. Uh, they seem to think of Pope Benedict was the worst thing that ever happened in the Catholic Church for women because he was so strict to biblical adherence. And then you get to Pope Francis, and the women see it as a liberation. He's even going around saying atheists will make it into heaven. So it's good for atheism, too. So what, the old joke was... Is the Pope Catholic? Well, yeah, because of course. But I don't uh, think Pope Francis is actually Catholic, is he? <laughs> well, he goes against historic Roman Catholicism, and so that's where the problem lies with the conservative cardinals. They don't know what to do with them. But it's really interesting when we look at this because what he's doing is he's denying the exclusivity of the gospel. Mm. He's basically saying that everyone, he's a universalist. He believes that everyone will be in heaven. He's denied that there is no hell. And so what he's saying is that everyone is a child of God. And this, of course, goes directly against the Bible because the Lord Jesus himself, when he was confronting the apostate religious leaders of his day, he said, you are children of the devil, your father. And then, of course, in 1 John, we see that there are children of the devil who practice unrighteousness and children of God who practice righteousness. So clearly, not everyone is a child of God. But this is the Pope's global agenda to unite all people as children of God and to suggest that everyone will be in heaven. And he's yeah. very open about it. He came out with a video a few years ago where he was there with uh, two or three other different religions. They all held their hands out with a particular symbol of their religion together. And he was making a proclamation that all the religions should get along. And basically this ecumenical one world type. In early 2021, the Pope traveled to the Middle East and met with some of the most radical uh, imams and heads of various uh, splinters of the Muslim faith to basically say, hey, we are on equal terms and it's just different paths. And that, that message has gone out very clearly to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear and realize that this is dangerously false in terms of leading people astray and not proclaiming to them the, the need to embrace the, the only way, truth, and, and life, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I like to say he is the truth for those who are deceived. He's the way for those who are lost, and he's the life for those who are dead in their sin. We must come through Christ in order to have salvation. And I think... Uh, you know, what we're doing, we're talking a lot about the Pope and how unorthodox he is. There's an exhortation in Romans 5.11 that we are to expose the evil deeds of darkness. And I think we would all agree that the most evil thing anyone could ever do would be to deceive people about life's most critical issue. Yes. And that is, what must I do to be saved? So for this Pope to preach another gospel, he's mm -hmm. under the condemnation of God. Because in Galatians 1... Six to nine, if anyone preaches another gospel, they are to be condemned. And so our desire is to encourage Roman Catholics to look into the word, see what the gospel is. Don't believe this false prophet. And he has become the most influential false prophet in the world well, today. And to be very clear, it is not we who are the condemners, but it is the word of God. And so everything that we are advocating is tested against the word of God. It's not our opinion. It's what scripture has, has pointed out and what the faithful have carried through in the faith of true Christianity all for the last 2,000 years. Excellent. Well, folks, we're going to take a break for an announcement. And when we come back, we're going to ask Mike to respond to some more of the very controversial comments. The Welcome back to Christ and Prophecy and our discussion of Pope Francis with former Catholic Mike Gendron. Well, Mike, I'd like to run through some of the controversial statements that Pope Francis has made in sort of a lightning round and get your response, if that's okay. Sure. All right, so one of the things he said is, atheists who do good are redeemed, not just Catholics. Well, we know from Scripture that you must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, we must also recognize that the Pope believes in a works righteousness salvation, so doing good is the ultimate goal in order to get to heaven. Ah. All the religions of the world believe that same thing, which is why in the end times there will be a global religion all believing in a works righteousness salvation. Mm -hmm. Well, how about this one, Mike? If Martians were to land on earth today, I would offer to baptize them. 
Well, in Roman Catholicism, baptism is the sacrament of regeneration and justification. So that's what puts you on the road to heaven. And so it's a very... important sacrament, which is why the Pope would want to do that in order for all people to be saved. Yeah, but adding Martians to the list seems to strain the, uh, the credibility. What about this? Uh, the big, big Bang Theory does not contradict the role of God as the divine creator. Yeah, the Pope is really into evolution. He says it's necessary in order to believe in creation, which is puzzling to me because we see the Genesis account, which the Pope denies that God created the world in six days and then rested. Wow. Well, how about this one? If someone is gay and is searching for the Lord and has goodwill, then who am I to judge him? Well, the Bible has judged homosexuals. It is a sin, and homosexuals must repent and believe the gospel, trust in Jesus, not only for the forgiveness of sins, but also for the power to become victorious over that sin. Yes, as with all other sins. I mean, all of us fall short of the glory of God, which is why all of us are sinners, and all of us must repent of that sinful behavior, that sinful nature, and come to the Lord God through Jesus Christ, His only Son. Well, on that note, the Pope also said this, God is not a divine being or a magician. It's really amazing for the Pope to deny that Christ or God is divine, and yet that's what he does, again, going against not only the Bible, but also historic Roman Catholicism. Catholicism has always taught that God is divine. Well, and clearly Catholicism or, and Catholics, I'll even say this, have been stalwarts at times of standing on certain principles. So, for instance, in this country, Catholics were sort of the lead voices pushing back against uh, an agenda of abortion. So they really started some of the pro-life movement, and we're very grateful for that. Some of the most faithful members of the Supreme Court have been Catholic, uh, very famously in the last number of years. And we appreciate that truth. But uh, when you start denying even the divinity of God, you have left the reservation of the, the Christian faith, I would assert, obviously. Well, obviously, we discussed this a little earlier, but his meetings with Muslims, ecumenicalism. There's a church, or, or it's, it's a church slash synagogue slash mosque built in Germany that he went and endorsed. Uh, that just, to me, shocks. He, he, well, if you understand Roman Catholicism, this is where the Pope agrees with the Catechism of the Catholic Church, because in paragraph 846, it says that the Muslims are part of God's plan of salvation. And so they have chosen this group of Muslims, 1.5 billion people, to be part of God's plan of salvation. And I really believe that Mary will one day be the catalyst that will unite Islam and Roman Catholicism because Muslims esteem Mary as the most revered woman who's ever lived. She appears 37 times in the Quran, And so Muslims now are going to apparition sites to get a message from Mary. Wow. And this is all part of the end time scenario. We know that in the end time, Satan will appear as an angel of light to deceive the world. And so mm. we see this happening today. Well, that brings up the question then is, where is this going in the field of eschatology or in yes. times of Bible study? Where do you see the Catholic Church role before the rapture and after the rapture? Well, a lot of people are unaware, but Roman Catholicism does have an eschatology. And you can actually search this uh, through the web, but they believe that there will be a Roman Catholic pope who will unite with a Roman Catholic monarch who together will establish a time of peace and prosperity on the earth. And so... We look at the papacy as being the false prophet. We see from the book of Revelation there will be a false prophet. Not the Antichrist, because I think, what, for centuries people believed the Antichrist would be the Pope. Yes, you the, think reformers, he's more the, false the reformers prophet? believe the Pope was the Antichrist, but I, okay. having studied Revelation, I see a false prophet. The Pope is the most influential false prophet in the world today. Um, Roman Catholics have been indoctrinated to believe that anybody who sits on the papal throne is holy, and when he sits on the chair of Peter, he is infallible. So here you have a false prophet said to be infallible when it comes to faith and morals, and so he will be influential in uniting the world because people esteem him as a leader who cannot lie or deceive people. And, and let's be clear, when we use the word false prophet, we don't throw that around casually. The, mm -hmm. the Bible says that anyone who makes a a prediction of what will happen as a revelation from God, and it does not occur, is a false prophet. And anyone who steers the faithful away from the true doctrines 
that are revealed in Scripture is a false prophet. So we're not just throwing around that charge uh, haphazardly, and, and it's not us that is making that accusation. It's the Scripture that points out who we should avoid and the falsehoods that we should flee from, quite frankly. And that's what your ministry is all about. So as opposed to that eschatology, contrast that with what we reveal, what Scripture reveals as the true uh, end times plan that God has put into place and has foretold. Well, we look to be looking at the um, rapture as the next event that will take place. Hallelujah, yes. Yes, and when all the sanctified believers are taken to heaven, the, the only people left are professing Christians, Roman Catholics, and people of world religions. And they're all going to be religions that focus on a works righteousness salvation. That will be the glue that unites all the religions of the world. And when you have a pope that says all people are children of God, that there is no hell, that even atheists will make it to heaven... This is what the world wants to hear. Mm -hmm. And so this will be the agenda of either Pope Francis or we don't know the Lord's timing, but whoever the Pope may be. There's a third role in the tribulation. We read about, the, of course, the Antichrist and the false prophet. But there appears to be a mystery Babylon religion, a ecumenical religion that takes hold at the first half of the tribulation. And the ten kings and Antichrist hate it and end up killing it. Could the Pope not is an alternative, not be the false prophet who leads a, basically Satan worship in the second half, but be the head of that ecumenical religion that will be destroyed midway through the tribulation. Well, we do know that um, the Catholic Church is worshiping a false Christ today. In fact, I brought with me a, a Eucharist. The Catholic Church believes that the priest and all the clergy have the power to call the Lord Jesus Christ down from heaven and through the miracle of transubstantiation change the inner substance into the physical body and blood, soul, and divinity. The priest and the pope lifts this up and says, this is the body of Christ, and all the Catholic faithful say yes. So they are worshiping a false Christ. And I'm saying this by the authority of Scripture because Jesus even said, if anyone says here is the Christ, do not believe them. We know that Jesus will remain in heaven until all of his enemies have been made his footstool. We know that, according to Hebrews 9.28, he will appear a second time and not in relation to sin. And so this cannot be Christ by the authority of Scripture because the Catholic Jesus returns every day to the earth. So it's so easy to see how the world is going to worship a false Christ when you have 1.2 billion Catholics worshiping a false Christ today. And let me also state this. Uh, it, it's not just Catholics who put their their reliance of salvation in their own works, their own righteous deeds. Uh, I, if you weigh the, the good against the bad that I've done in my life, I think I'll be okay. There are a lot of other people in a lot of other Protestant uh, denominations who really boil down their own uh, reliance of salvation on that, that equation. I, well, I think I've been a pretty good person, or I've done a lot of good, or, or whatever. And they don't put their, their trust in Jesus Christ. Did you know that we are living in the end times and that the Holy Spirit is calling us to do three specific things as we prepare for the soon return of Jesus? These things are related to our spiritual gifts. Do you know what your spiritual gifts are? Do you know the difference in a natural talent and a supernatural gift? Do you know that you are going to one day stand before Jesus and be judged as to how you used your spiritual gifts to advance His kingdom here on earth? For more information about how to identify your spiritual gifts and use them for the Lord, Stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Two weeks ago, we began presenting a series of three programs devoted to one of the most powerful end-time messages contained in the Bible. It is the message of Psalm 2. I like to call the message, The King is Coming. We began by focusing on the first three verses, which make it clear that God and Satan are still engaged in a cosmic battle for sovereignty over this earth. God originally gave that sovereignty to Adam and Eve, but Satan stole it when they sinned. At the cross, Jesus won the right to reclaim it for us, but He will not do so until He returns to reign during the millennium. Meanwhile, 
the struggle continues to manifest itself in many ways in our world today, most notably in Satan's determination to destroy the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. Now, last week, we learned from verses 4 through 9 that although wickedness seems to be growing on the earth, God is in control. For He has the wisdom and the power to orchestrate all the evil of mankind to the triumph of His Son. In fact, Psalm 2 says that God sits in heaven and laughs at the world leaders who try to flaunt His will. Why is He laughing? Because He has appointed a day when He will pour out His wrath on those who are rebelling against Him, and He has promised that one day soon He will send His Son to bring peace, righteousness, and justice to all the earth. In this program, we're going to take a look at the ending of the psalm, specifically verses 10 through 12. In this segment, the Holy Spirit presents a warning that we should be doing three things as we wait for the return of Jesus. Let's take a look for a moment at the warning that the Holy Spirit issues. Let's go to verse 10. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, lest He become angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all those who take refuge in Him. Now the first thing that I need to point out here is that yes, this is addressed to kings and judges, no doubt, to those who are in ruling authority, but it's also addressed to believers. It's addressed to you and me. I want to emphasize that. Because when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, we will be the kings, we will be the rulers, we will be the judges. Every person in a position of authority on planet earth will be a person in a glorified body. That's why the earth is going to be flooded with peace, righteousness, and justice. Reigning authority. 2 Timothy 2, verse 12. If we endure, we will reign with Him. Judging authority. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? We are going to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ. We are going to judge the world. We are going to be the ones who are going to reign with Him over this earth. He is going to reign from Jerusalem as King of kings and Lord of lords. David in his glorified body is going to reign as the King of Israel. We and our glorified bodies are going to be scattered over this earth to reign over those who are in the flesh. Every person in a position of reigning authority will be a person in a glorified body. Most of us, perhaps, or some of us anyway, are going to be administrators. Every person who's an administrator on planet earth, whether it's a local council, a state council, a national council, whether it's a king, a prime minister, a mayor, a governor, is going to be a person in a glorified body. Jesus said there's going to be degrees of reward. He said there's going to be degrees of reward based upon your service in the kingdom now, how you use your gifts to advance the kingdom. He said, some of you I will put over one city, some I'll put over five cities, some I'll put over ten cities. So some of us will be administrators. Some of us will be judges. I believe that every judge on planet earth will be a person in a glorified body. That's the reason the earth is going to be flooded with peace, righteousness, and justice is because under this theocratic reign of Jesus Christ, when a person violates the law, in, a person in the flesh violates the law, they will be arrested immediately. They will be taken before a judge. There will be an immediate trial. There will be an immediate judgment. And there will be no appeal whatsoever because that judge with the glorified body and the mind of Christ will make a perfect decision for which there will be no appeal. Justice will be swift. Justice will be certain. And that's the reason that those in the flesh who reject Jesus Christ during this time will nonetheless obey the law. They will say, we love you, Jesus, while they're grinding their teeth. And at the end of that time when Satan is let loose, what's going to happen? He's going to say to those in the flesh, come on, let's get the joker in Jerusalem. And after 1,000 years of perfect peace, righteousness, and justice, the vast majority of those in the flesh will rebel against Jesus Christ. And God will prove once and for all you cannot change anyone by putting them in a perfect environment. The only way you can change people is through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. He starts out history proving that in the Garden of Eden. He ends up history putting everybody in that Garden of Eden and proving it once again when the Great Rebellion occurs. Thirdly, the vast majority of us are going to be teachers. I believe every person on planet Earth, as Jeremiah says, we're going to be the shepherds of the earth. We'll be in glorified bodies teaching those who are in, uh, in fleshly bodies, trying to bring them to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you something there will not be. Praise God there will not be. There will not be any legislators during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. There will be no abomination 
No abomination known as the Texas legislature, no abomination known as the United States Congress, no abomination known as the United Nations, because there will be no legislature. Jesus will give the law, and the law will be obeyed. There will be no political parties, no pressure groups, no bribes. Oh boy, what a glorious day that's going to be, what we've dreamed about forever and ever. Well, Psalm 2 tells us something else. It tells us three things that we're to do as we wait for the coming of the Lord. And I want to end with this. The three things that we are to do as we wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, worship the Lord with reverence. Now, I tell you, I hope you make a note of these because I want to do all these things, and I know you do too. So, this is number one. But you know what it says in the Hebrew? It doesn't say that. In the Hebrew it says, serve the Lord with reverence. But I like this translation. You know why I like it? Because normally when we think of worship, we think of only one thing, going to a place and, 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 and singing with people and worshiping the Lord in that way. But the greatest worship is not that. The greatest worship is what happens when you leave the congregation, go out into the world, and how you serve the Lord, and how you radiate the love of Jesus Christ in your life. So I like, serve the Lord with reverence, but I love worship the Lord with reverence because true worship is serving the Lord Jesus Christ in the world. That's the number one thing we're to do. We are to serve the Lord Jesus Christ as we wait for the coming of the Lord. And let me tell you something, you will never be able to do it, never ever, until you know what your spiritual gifts are. And you work in those spiritual gifts. I had to learn that the hard way. I grew up in a church that didn't even believe in spiritual gifts. So when I started into ministry, I didn't know what a spiritual gift was. I was trying to operate outside my gifts and I was a miserable failure. Until I discovered what my gifts were, I never did do anything for the Lord. You have to work in your gifts. I urge you to find out what your spiritual gifts are and begin to use those to serve the Lord because that's what it means here when we are to worship the Lord with reverence. There's a second thing that we're to do. We are to rejoice with trembling. We're to rejoice with trembling. Now that's a strange statement. That is very strange. I think of rejoicing by clapping my hands, rejoicing by singing, rejoicing by dancing like Jack Hollinsworth, Jumping Jack does. Uh, that's, what I, that's what I think of when I think of, of, of rejoicing. But to rejoice with trembling? What in the world does that mean? I, I tell you, I, I prayed about that. I want, I want to know what these things mean. And I just wanted the Lord to reveal to me what it meant. And one day I, I was thinking about it, and, and, and I, I thought about this. I thought about the fact that we are to rejoice over His glorious return. We are to rejoice over the fact that He is going to have victory. We are to rejoice over the fact that one day He's going to receive all the glory that He was denied the first time He came. But at the same time we're rejoicing about His coming, and about the glorified bodies we're going to receive, we had better tremble. Because when He comes, there's going to be judgment for every one of us. Now, there's good news and bad news. Good news and bad news. The good news is so good that I find many Christians find it hard to believe. The good news is this. There will be no judgment for sin for those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Look what it says in Hebrews 9.28. Christ shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await Him. Why? Because when you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you're born again, He not only forgives your sin, He forgets your sin in the sense that He will never hold it against you again as long as you live. It's gone. It's as far away from Him as east is from west. The Bible says He puts it in the deepest part of the ocean. Corey Ten Boone used to say, yes, he does that. And he puts a sign there that says, no fishing. No fishing. Just leave it alone. Believe God has forgiven you and accept that forgiveness. He is going to judge us, but he's not going to judge us for sin. Praise God. But there's going to be a judgment. And this is why we better tremble. There's going to be a judgment of works. Not to determine our eternal salvation, no. But to determine our degrees of reward. 2 Corinthians 5.10 we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may be re recompensed for his deeds in the body. There's going to be degrees of punishment. There's going to be degrees of reward. And those degrees of reward, I believe, are going to be based upon a judgment of our, how we used our gifts to serve the Lord. I think each one of us is going to stand before the Lord and be judged of how we used our gifts to serve the Lord. And based upon that, he's going to hand out rewards or not hand out rewards. He's going to say, on the day you were born again, I gave to you the gift of mercy. How did you use it, to use it to advance my kingdom? On the day you were born again, I gave you the gift of, of teaching. How did you use that to advance my kingdom? And I'm talking about supernatural gifts here. I'm not talking about natural talents. Sometimes when God gifts us, 
And every person receives at least one gift. You may receive more than one. You may receive some others as you go along if you're good stewards of your gifts. But when God, He doesn't always gift you where your talents are. Sometimes He does. Sometimes a person who is talented in singing will be gifted in singing, as Jack has been. But sometimes that that won't be the case. Sometimes a person will be gifted who isn't the best singer in the world. You can tell the difference. A person who's talented gets up and sings the Lord's Prayer, and when they finish, they get a standing ovation. The person who is gifted of the Holy Spirit may sing it very imperfectly, may miss some notes, and when they finish, there's no applause because everybody's on the face, on the floor, weeping before the Lord because the Lord, through His Holy Spirit, has touched their hearts. Sometimes people will will be talented as teachers, but God will not gift them to teach the Word of God. Other times He may do that. We're talking here about supernatural gifts, and what I'm saying to you is, do you know your gifts so that you can use those to advance the kingdom? I urge you, find out what your gifts are and begin to use them to advance the kingdom. How can you find out? Well, let me give you some guidelines. Number one, pray for the Lord to reveal your gifts to you. Just just pray. God, I want to know what my gifts are. Reveal them to me. He'll do it in His own way. A second way is to study the Scriptures regarding gifts. Just just do a study of of all the Scriptures in the New Testament that have to do with the gifts of the Spirit and and, and ask the Lord again to bless you as you study those Scriptures. Number three, take a spiritual gifts inventory test. You find those all over the Internet. Just go to Google. Type in spiritual inventory test. They're all over the place. And you can take them. Some are interactive. You take them right there and it gives you your scores right there. When you finish the test, sometimes you have to print them off and do them. But let me tell you, I have found these to be very, very accurate. Very accurate. Very helpful in identifying what your spiritual gifts are. Another thing you can do is you can ask your Christian friends and your pastor to help you identify your gifts. I remember one time I was teaching on spiritual gifts, and we got to the last session. I said, now next week, I want everybody to identify what you think your spiritual gifts are. And we, next week, we went around the circle, and everybody identified, except this one guy. We got to him, and he said, well, I just tell you, I thought about it all week. I prayed about it. And I just think God skipped me. (laughs) And everybody there died laughing because every person there knew his gift. One of the ladies said, John, every time we have a church weekend where we're going to work on the building on Saturday, and they tell everybody to get there at 9, and we all get there at 9, who's been there since 6 a.m.? He said, me. And said, when we go home at 3, who's still there at 5? Said me. And he said, when we get divide up the judge, who jobs, who always uh, volunteers for the worst jobs, cleaning the bathrooms and things like that? He said, me. They said, you have the supernatural gift of helps. No church can exist without it. No ministry can exist without it. It's essential to the kingdom of God. And he got so happy when he found out that he had a supernatural gift of God and realized it really was a gift of God. And he began to work in that gift even more so than he had before that. Another thing you can do is to read a very balanced book about gifts. And that's hard to find because there are a lot of very unbalanced books out there. And the one that I would suggest to you among all others is this one by Leslie B. Flynn entitled 19 Gifts of the Spirit. It's one that's available through our ministry. I read it years ago. It's in the umpteenth edition. It's just, it's just so balanced and it's so wonderful in helping you to identify your spiritual gifts. Leslie Flynn is a, is a Baptist pastor. This is a very balanced book, and it will really help you to identify what your gifts are. Okay, that brings us back to Psalm 2 and the third thing we're to do. The third thing we're to do, we're to do homage to the Son. Now, I don't like this translation because that's not what it says. If you've got the King James, I think it says, uh, has the actual literal uh, translation from the Hebrew. It says in the Hebrew, kiss the Son. The third thing that we are to do is we are to kiss the Son. Now, folks, I, I tell you, I, for years I scratched my head on that one. What in the world does it mean to kiss the sun? I mean, that's a strange statement. And I prayed. I, I said, Lord, I want to know what this means. I want to do these things. I want to teach others what to do. What does it mean to kiss the sun? And one day he led me to the book of Hosea. I read that glorious book. And Hosea was called by God to go out and preach against idolatry in the land. He preached his heart out against idolatry. And he was he was stoned, he was mocked, he was uh, ridiculed, he was spit upon, but he preached. And it says right near the end of the book that when he came back home, totally exhausted from preaching his heart out against idolatry, he got ready to go into his house and he looked next door, and on the front porch next door, 
There was a man bowing down to a golden calf, and he was kissing the calf. And Hosea cries out, oh, my God, men kiss calves. And suddenly it clicked. Men kiss calves. Holy Spirit says, kiss the son. You see, if Hosea were here today and he went across this land, I think he would get up here and he'd say, I've been everywhere in America and everywhere I go, I see men kissing CDs in the bank. I see men kissing fame. I see men kissing power. I see men kissing influence. I see men kissing all the things of the world. I say to you, take those, put them in one garbage pile, and kiss the Son. Fall in love with Jesus Christ. Put Him first and foremost in your life above everything else. Fall in love with Jesus. That's what kiss the Son, I think, truly means. And let me tell you something. When you do that, when you truly kiss the Son, you will understand that final statement. How blessed are those who take refuge in Him. What is the message of Psalm 2? The message of Psalm 2 is that God is on the throne. God is in control. He has the wisdom and the power to orchestrate all the evil of mankind to the triumph of His Son. And the greatest illustration of that is the cross itself. Think how Satan must have thought he had the greatest victory in the history of mankind. Think about how he and the demons must have danced around that cross as they murdered the Son of God. And he thought he had his greatest victory. Until the resurrection occurred. Amen. And through the power of the resurrection, God took the most dastardly act in the history of mankind and transformed it into the most glorious event that has ever occurred on the face of this earth. When I think of that, when I think of it, when I think of the fact that God is in control, that God sits in the heavens and laughs, that God orchestrates the evil of mankind, the triumph of His Son, when I think about the peace, righteousness, and justice that is coming, all I can do is cry out from the depths of my heart, Maranatha, 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 come quickly, Lord Jesus. And my question for you this evening is, and for you, those of you who are viewing, my question is, are you ready? Are you ready if the Lord were to come today? In John 3.36, it's amazing, everybody knows John 3.16, almost nobody knows John 3.36. This is from a sermon by John the Baptist. He says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That means, friends, listen to me carefully here, it means that every person in this room and every person on planet earth is under either the grace of God or the wrath of God. It is a terrible thing to be under the wrath of God. It is a glorious thing to be under the grace of God. If you're under the grace of God, when Jesus appears, you will go forth like a calf released from a stall. Some of you will dance in the Spirit and never moved your feet before. Some of you will have your hands in the air waving them. Because you're going to be like a calf released. You know what a calf released from a stall is like? They hate stalls. You release them, they run out in the pasture, they roll over, they kick their feet in the air. They're happy. But if you're under the wrath of God, it says the presidents, the prime ministers, the kings of this world, all those who are under the wrath of God will crawl into holes in the ground and cry out for the rocks and mountains to fall upon them. So great will be the wrath of Almighty God. I want to close with an illustration. My wife and I have a devotional every morning, have for years. We pray together and we always read a devotional together. About five years ago, I read a devotional that so profoundly impacted me that I bowed my head and I said, Lord, I'm going to, have, I'm going to share this with as many people as I can until the day I die or you come first. I'm going to share it and share it and share it. Because it's one of the greatest illustrations I've ever run across about the meaning of the cross and what happened there. Back in the 1850s, when the gold rush occurred, thousands of wagon trains went across this country to California. And there were many things that the wagon masters feared. They feared getting to water holes that were dried up or polluted, they feared Indian attacks. They feared such things as plagues, which often wiped out an entire wagon train. Probably the thing they feared the most were blizzards, which also wiped out entire wagon trains. But certainly one of the most fearsome things that they could encounter was this, the prairie fire. They would look on the horizon and see smoke. Maybe there had been a lightning strike. And the wagon master, who knew nature well, knew that there were only minutes to save the wagon train because those, those fires often traveled at a speed of 50 to 60 miles an hour. You would be in Kansas. The grass would be this high. 
just as dry as it could be, and you could see the fire coming, you knew you only had minutes. And the interesting thing is that although wagon trains often encountered prairie fires, there is no record of any wagon train ever being lost to one because there was a certain way of avoiding it. Here's what would happen. If the fire was coming from this direction, then the wagon master would go around to this side and he would light the grass and let it burn away. And when it burned away sufficiently, it'd take the wagons and he would circle them inside the burned out area and they would take the fabric off the top of the wagons and wait for the fire to come. And when the fire came, it would just burn around them and keep on going. Now I submit to you, that is one of the greatest illustrations you can find of what happened on the cross. When Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, every sin that you have ever committed and every sin you will ever commit was placed upon Him. And the wrath of God, which we deserve, was poured out upon Jesus Christ. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you step into the area where the fire has already fallen and you become immune to the wrath of God. What a glorious Savior. What a glorious Savior. And anyone who understands that must live every day with the shout of Maranatha, Maranatha, Maranatha in their hearts, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Thank you and God bless you. And now I'd like to present you with a very special treat from our featured singer, Jack Hollinsworth. Here is Jack singing about the fact that the signs of the times indicate that we are living on borrowed time. The title of the song is 1159. Time is winding down, just look around us. Evil's breaking loose on every side. The devil knows his time is almost over. Soon the clock will stop and Jesus Christ will split the sky. Shout it from the rooftops, proclaim. More and more churches are offering courses in what they call Christian yoga. Is there really such a thing as Christian yoga? Or have some sincere Christians been sincerely deceived? And how did a feature of a pagan Eastern religion get mixed in with Christianity in the first place? For some insights into these questions, stay tuned for an interview with a world-class expert on yoga. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents... Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end-time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Ray. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Once again, this week, my colleague Nathan Jones and I are delighted to have as our special guest one of Christendom's foremost experts on Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism. Our guest is Carol Matriciana, a writer and video producer from California. Carol, welcome back to Christ in Prophecy. Thank Promise. you very much for we having me. We are delighted to this. have you. And I tell you, Carol, that program we did last week was a real blockbuster. I still feel... Uh, tingling all over from your testimony about how you went to a place looking for drugs and found Jesus Christ. <laughs> Incredible story. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 Nathan, why don't you tell our viewers how uh, they can view that program on our website? Sure. Our website has many of our Christ and Prophecy episodes. Just click Multimedia and Television. Our programs are there, including the ones with Carol. Uh, during the week of broadcast, we'll actually have it on every page of the website. Just click the button. You can watch it right online. 
Well, Nathan, how about kicking off our discussion today? Sure. We're talking about yoga, and you're an expert. Can you tell us why you're an expert on yoga? Well, Nathan, I was actually born and raised in India for the first 20 years of my life, so I saw the practice of yoga. I wasn't involved in it because I realized it was Hinduism. I mean, in, in fact, in, in Hindu teaching, it is known that there is no yoga without Hinduism. There is no Hinduism without yoga. Interesting. The two cannot be separated. It cannot be separated into spiritual exercise because the very point of yoga, which was designed in the Bhagavad Gita, which is the Hindu writings, the Hindu holy scriptures, they call it, the Bhagavad Gita, the actual God, the deity in there designed yoga for the individual to connect to his God consciousness. In Hinduism, they don't believe that you're a sinner. They believe that you're ignorant of your divinity. So the spark within you has to be ignited through yoga discipline. And um, in, in fact, another interesting thing is that it's believed that there is a lying, a coiled serpent asleep in each person waiting to be awakened through yoga disciplines. The serpent is known as wisdom, power, knowledge, and if that is brought up through the chakras, which are energy psychic centers, they call them, it's, a, it's metaphysics, it's not true, it's not scientific, uh, certainly not biblical, but the snake is brought up through self-hypnosis, through going within oneself, through breathing, through waking it up, through uh, disciplines, repetitive saying the names of the deities again and again through repetitive things called mantras, repetitive prayer, through breathing, pushing it up till eventually it comes to the third eye, the sixth chakra, and then comes into the mind, into consciousness where you realize that you're divinity and you your connect divinity. that you are divinity huh. because within Hinduism, it's understood that divinity is in everything. God is in everything. Everything is divine, whether it's the rat on the street, the cow in the street, the monkeys in the trees, you. In fact, in, before every yoga class, you say namaste. That means in Hindi, the God within me bows to the God within you. So that is all an integral part of the spiritual discipline of yoga. And Brahman is understood to be a God consciousness, not a person. So when you say that you become God, in the Western world, we see God, the God of the Bible, the creator God, is a person, and Jesus Christ, his Son, and the Holy Spirit, three persons in one, the triune God. That is not the case in Hinduism. In Hinduism, it's a consciousness. It's a force. It's a thinking that you need to connect into. So in fact, you need to alter your worldview. Did you ever become a practitioner of yoga? Yes, I so did. So you have experienced it firsthand, not just observing it. No. As I grew up in India, I observed it being practiced. But uh, in when I was about 19, 20, my parents returned mm -hmm. to England. I got involved in the New Age, which I didn't realize was a religious uh, mechanism to change our worldview into an Eastern mm -hmm. mystical worldview. So the New Age that I saw in the West was a completely polished cleaned up, appealing, manipulative enticement into a different worldview. Did the yoga work in the, in the sense that it really can bring you into an altered state of consciousness? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It is a powerful spiritual What's wrong with going into an altered state of consciousness? Well, you, first of all, you give up your mind, yes. but you don't realize you're giving up your mind. <laughs> and the first commandment says that we need to love the Lord our God with all our heart and our mind. We're not allowed to put our mind into neutral mm -hmm. within, biblical, um, within the biblical mandate. In fact, uh, David talks about that I meditate on your law day and night. The Lord tells us to bind his law on our heads. So it's a mental rumination of meditating on the word, which is quite different in the practice of yoga, where you meditate on an experience. Mm -hmm. So you, you go into yourself and you imagine and you have subjective emotions about what you feel. And it's very, very powerful. Wouldn't this open you up to demon possession or at least demonic attack? Well, I didn't know at the time, because I wasn't a Bible-believing Christian, that what I was getting involved in was opening doorways into the occult, opening doorways into demons. And is that I what that snake is? Is that a demonic spirit? 
Well, the snake is the master of all demonic spirits. It was the snake in Ezekiel and Isaiah and the stories we're told there where he says, I will be like the Most High. He acknowledges that there is a Most High. So the serpent, the Lucifer, the snake, knows there is a monotheistic God. But I will be like the Most High is that he introduces polytheism. Many gods, the idea that we can all be like gods. And why not? Because we're in the Bible, we're told that we're children of God, but, and we're also told that we're created in his image, but we're not children of God until we come through Jesus Christ, through repentance. So what this is, is it's a counterfeit way through, of experiencing uh, uh, through creative manipulation, which is what Satan did. He was a liar. He said, I will be like the Most High. He created in his imagination a reality that doesn't exist. He cannot be the Most High. Now, Carol, a few years ago, uh, you went back to India and you produced a a major documentary on yoga called Yoga Uncoiled. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, tell us about your experience there in India. Well, the reason I went was because Christians today are practicing yoga and it's being called Christianized yoga. Mm-hmm. It, it can't, that there, there is no such thing. It's like saying Christianized Hinduism. It's like saying Christianized occultism. Yeah, well, I want to get into that in a moment. I want you to tell us right now, what did you do in India? Well, I went to interview yogis. Okay. Th- those are the practitioners of yoga to say, can the spiritual discipline, the spiritual connections of yoga be separated from the physical exercises because in America, everybody's saying that they're just involved in yoga, which they called flexing and stretching. And were were they willing to be interviewed? Oh, yes. Oh, in the movie, in the movie you see in Yoga Uncoiled, I interview not only the yogas, yogis in India, those are the yoga teachers in India and actually film classes going on and people that can explain what yoga means in India, but I also so then interviewed a Christian who teaches yoga. She's a pastor wow. in her church. Okay, this is fascinating. Yoga. I tell you what I want to do. I want to pause right now and show a clip from that uh, documentary called Yoga Uncoiled. Today in the West, about 35 million Americans are into yoga, just seeing yoga as a physical fitness. Yoga is a Hindu word. Yoga is a Hindu discipline to become one with the universal consciousness, which means become one with God. Which God? Brahma, the Hindu God. There are many various paths to yoga. Uh, In the sacred text of Hinduism called Bhagavad Gita indicates uh, three different paths. First of all, Bhakti Veda is a focus on a deity. Then Jnana Yoga is a focus on wisdom. Then the karma yoga is uh, based on your good deeds and actions. You have a number of yogas. Yoga is not one entity, but it has a wide variety of yogas. Uh, So each yoga has a physical aspect and a spiritual aspect. The physical aspect is controlling the physical body. They control the breathing. They control the uh, mind, thinking activity. They control the physical movements. And so... Uh, and the timely behavior to discipline the body in the morning, night, how to uh, control the bowel movement. These are all the forms of the physical part of the yoga. If you're practicing Jnana Yoga, or should I say Raja Yoga, the primary focus of that technique is to bring the mind into perfect stillness and to focus the mind in a very deliberate way on a particular uh, sound or vibration or image as it may be in the Tibetan Mahayana tradition of Buddhism that brings the, the mind into a state of quiescence, peace, such that revelation can occur, experiential penetration of a higher truth or another truth. So it's a way of manipulating the mind to generate different uh, experiences or insights or cognitions that are supposed to be connected to the apprehension, experiential apprehension of higher realities. According to Hinduism, The highest reality is to become aware of one's own divinity. Hinduism respects everything as deity. The cows on the street, the monkeys in the city, the idols which are half men, half animal like creatures. But the highest goal is realization of one's personal divinity or God consciousness. This realization can be experienced through direct perception deep within one's own mind 
a place known as the seat of concentrated wisdom, an area between the eyebrows, which is known as the third eye. It is also called the sixth chakra, meaning wheel, and recognized as psychic energy. The other chakras are said to run along the spine, starting at the bottom, blossoming at the top, meeting at the agna, meaning command. Here, at the agna, the third eye is the central point where all experience is gathered in total concentration and is also believed to be the base of all creation itself. In this hotel where I was staying, each morning the local priest would come to offer the morning puja or prayer rituals to the gods. He'd prepare arti, the celebration of light through fire and mix the vermilion red mixture for bindi or kumkum, the dot seen between the eyebrows. This bindi or kumkum is believed to retain psychic energy in the human body and control the various levels of concentration. Here, the hotel manager explains that the bindi or kumkum and arthi fire are being prepared not only for the gods, but also the hotel guests who are esteemed as gods. For our gods, we place this kumkum as a tradition. Okay? The guests are a god. The guests who are coming in here are our gods. Okay? So we keep the bindi, we do the arati and the bindi for the guests. They are like our gods. Uh, in Hinduism, they have more than 330 million gods. That means everything is God. Whatever you see, whatever you touch is God. And uh, the sun god the moon god and all all everything is god so man and nature man and animal are one welcome back to christ and prophecy in our interview with carol matriciani the producer of the video yoga uncoiled carol uh, I want to get into our discussion in this segment by reading you a statement that was made recently by Albert Moeller, who is the president of uh, Southern Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, he spoke out against uh, the practice of yoga, and he generated a storm of controversy. Uh, as you yeah, know, this I is a very imagine. controversial. <laughs> and he said this, quote, The idea that the body is a vehicle for reaching consciousness with the divine is not Christianity. Christians who practice yoga must either deny the reality of what yoga represents or fail to see the contradictions between their Christian commitments and their embrace of yoga. What is your response? Well, their embrace of Eastern mysticism. That's exactly what it is because yoga was specifically designed for a purpose within Eastern mysticism. One, to awaken the idea that we are divine and that divinity is within us and we are one with everything. The second is to shorten our reincarnation cycle, to prepare us for our reincarnation cycle. That's the purpose of yoga. Cycle. The purpose <laughs> of yoga is to teach you how to die in order that you can come back in your next life as a better person. It's suicide? So it's suicide. <laughs> yoga is suicide. It is, an, it is a discipline to prepare you for death in the, within the context hmm. of Hinduism, which believes that your spirit, that you don't die, that you come back again and again and again. In fact, Gandhi said that reincarnation is a hopeless cycle of imprisonment. The Hindu knows they cannot get out of reincarnation, that they're going to be born again, die again, born again, die again. So why, my question would be to a Bible-believing Christian that understands that Jesus Christ died because we were separated from him through our sins. He died in order to give us reconciliation with life for eternity, we've got reconciliation through Jesus Christ. Why practice a discipline designed for death? So basically what you're saying is that the term 